Welcome to K Wave 6 Radio, your show for all things positive, with your host, Kirk Spencer. Hello, welcome to K Wave 6 Radio. This is your host, Kirk Spencer. Uh, today I have a special guest, at least one is very special. I know you hear me say special guest quite often, but I consider all my guests to be special. But this is one that I listen to his videos every day. Every day, seven days a week. This guy has a following that by noon, my time, he usually has around five to 10,000 views on YouTube every day. Uh, he's very popular on YouTube, but it's because of his content. And I'm going to give you some hints about who he is, especially if you're one who listens to him. Are you a person who's interested in the weather? Not just on your own local basis, what's going on in your neck of the woods, but what's going on in the world? Are you interested in what we normally call global warming, but which we can actually see as global change or climate change? Um, would you like to know the real reasons behind global weather change? Well, this guy's videos are something that you could watch every day and even go to his website and learn about it. Uh, he doesn't ask for any money. He's not selling anything. Uh, he does have a program where you can become a membership of it for a small fee. And uh, this is something that helps you understand how the weather works, not just on Earth, but its influences from the sun. And I've learned a great deal from listening to this guy's show every day, more than I thought I knew. And I even looked at some of the um, information that he gets his uh, information from such as ISWA, I-S-W-A. Uh, I can look at it, I can understand some of it, but he explains it even further, much more than I know. Uh, and just as we get into the in in introduction for this guy, he ends his show every day with this one phrase. Eyes open, no fear. Be safe, everyone. If you don't know who that is, it just gives me a chill listening to that. If you don't know who this guy is, let me introduce you to Ben Davidson. Welcome to the show, Ben. Hi, uh, thanks for having me on, Kurt. Oh, it's my pleasure. I've been listening to you for quite some time. We talked about uh, how I came across your show in the beginning. Uh, well, when we were getting to know each other a little bit in our pre-interview. Um... I was always looking for something that was going to give me some information about what is going on and what um, my local weather doesn't really explain. And sometimes even the Weather Channel doesn't explain it. It just gives you a reporting about this is what is going on, that's what happened, so on and so forth. So when I found yours, Suspicious Observers, um, that's what you can find on YouTube, or that's actually his website, suspiciousobservers.org. Org. There you go. And uh, you can get a lot of information about what Ben is doing there. And he just started a, a new venture in his weather. Um, actually, why don't you tell us about the Mobile Observatory? Well, absolutely. Um, well, like you said, we do our programming every day. Uh, in the last three years, we haven't missed uh, a single day, uh, whether it's a holiday, weekend, doesn't matter. I wake up and I can think of nothing else. But there's some things I can't do from my computer. There's some things that ISWA and NASA's websites and the satellite feeds just can't show you. Um, I want to go out to the West Coast. You know, I'm based in Columbus, Ohio, but I want to go out to the West Coast and monitor the the radiation for myself to see if there is any. I want to do the same near the WIP uh, plutonium facility in New Mexico, see if these things are really as bad as, uh, as they seem. I want to go out and meet, uh, I want to go out and meet all the people who have supported uh, the efforts and the research and the videos as well. Um, as you said, by lunchtime on 
uh, at least on the East Coast, there's five or 10,000 uh, views on YouTube. After about 24 hours, there's about 30 to 35,000 views um, every single day. And these aren't just people who view. These are interested, um, interested parties. They care about these things. It's not just... Um, it's not like I'm a celebrity to them. It's like I'm, <clears throat> it's like I'm one of them. I'm in the room with them. And you know, in the first couple of stops we've had on the Mobile Observatory Project tour, which has had two stops so far, uh, the people who have come out have really, um, they've really confirmed that this small group get together, talk about these sort of things, ask questions, discuss issues. There's a lot of value to it. Now, what the Mobile Observatory Project actually is, before dedicating my life to this stuff, where my passion is, these sciences, um, my wife and I were both in the suit and tie corporate world, uh, which we've both left now for this. Mm -hmm. We're renting out our home got rid of all our stuff, and we are going to full-time it in a 36-foot Class A RV that through a Kickstarter campaign funded by the people who have shown us so much support over the last three years, we helped turn this RV into truly a mobile observatory. And not just observatory in the common sense where you think about looking at the sky uh, and the stars. Uh, although we absolutely uh, can do that in multiple ways. But it's an observatory for the environment, an observatory for the weather and climate as well. Um, and when I say weather and climate, um, you know, I suppose I do obviously mean the weather outside and also really kind of take the temperature of the populace about some of the more important issues. Um, you know, there are a lot of conspiracy theories uh, that make their way through uh, these type of alternative news uh, communities. There's a lot of concern over geoengineering. There's a lot of concern over climate change and things having to do with the sun and government and even down to war. So really taking the pulse and the temperature of all of these people who really allow us to do this in the first place. And of course, along the way, we have stops where we're going to be giving speeches. Uh, a couple of schools have asked us to come and, and do a few shows. But the majority of the stops are really just going to be casual, social meet and greets where you guys can, uh, you know, people can come out. They can see the observatory, see all of the equipment that we have on there. Um, the equipment that we do have on there, we have an all-sky meteor camera built into the roof. And uh, that will be part of the All Sky Meteor Network. Mm -hmm. uh, there are only a couple of mobile units to that, so that'll be very fun. I can't wait to catch my first meteor in that. And if a UFO happens to go over top of my head, I'll catch that too. <laughs> I've also got uh, a pretty nice Celestron telescope. It's nothing super fancy. Uh, you know, it's what I can take in the rv but i've got a solar filter for it and it is big enough of a celestron that you can easily see the sunspots and uh, after showing a couple of kids uh their first sunspot with their own eyes it uh, you can see what happens in their face and you you get this little sense of hope ignited in you that they've had uh, a love of science ignited in them for life it's it's really wonderful, and of course I've got environmental, I've got uh, radiation detection equipment, I've got a geomagnetometer. Um, I'm going to test some solar effects on ground uh, electric currents up in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, we are taking the tour to Canada as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's that's that's the short of it. <laughs> well, I'm glad the short was actually a little bit longer. Uh, let's go from here. Let's get a little background on uh, on you, Ben, because uh, I, I've told um, quite a number of people, some friends of mine, about your program on YouTube, and I guess they've become followers of yours as well, even people in uh, the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And I know you can't drive the RV over there, but <laughs> who knows? I would need some very big floaties. Yeah, exactly. But uh, your background, now, you come across very knowledgeable uh, on your videos and in what you write on your website. Uh, so 
I, you've made mention about what you do with PhD people and so on and so forth. So let's go into you have a bachelor's degree in economics, which is kind of like mm, economics on one hand and meteorology, if you want to use that term, on the other hand. They're not quite the same. But you also have a law degree in environmental law. So I can see how that leads into it. So why don't you enlighten us from there? Well, to, uh, absolutely. Um, technically, uh, the, the degree is just a, a, a Juris Doctorate, a normal law degree, but I, I put my focus towards environmental law. There, there was an environmental focus for sure. And that's not that's not just the the, the lone genesis of where – uh, my interest in the natural sciences came. I've always been interested in the natural sciences. I I graduated from Denison University, but I started at Penn State. And when I was there, uh, I was going to be the I was going to be a weatherman. I was taking meteorology classes. Uh, I was taking chemistry classes, physics classes, took some math classes, um, and I really found myself uh, unable to cope with how they were teaching the weather. And uh, it, it seemed counterintuitive to me. I, I figured uh, my questions were not answered so much as they were stifled. And uh, I really, really just had to go a different way. I transferred to Denison, uh, got out of the sciences for a bit. But after law school, uh, I had done... I had done two legal internships that were very, very much uh, straight legal. One was at a, at a law firm in Pittsburgh, and the other one was uh, actually with uh, Justice Pfeiffer in the, uh, in the Supreme Court of Ohio. I was working for his, uh, his direct clerk, and I knew I never wanted to be a lawyer. I mean, that was, that was you know, before the first and the second years of law school, by the third and last year of law school, I, I knew uh, at that point already I didn't want to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And so what I did after that really paved the way for what's happening now. If you know anything about due diligence, about equity investments, yeah. there are three elements to the investment, basically. What are the economics of the investment? What are the legal concerns um, whether that's can you do what you're trying to do, uh, intellectual property, regulations, whatever. And then the third part is the specifics of whatever it is you're investing in. Now, what uh, what I did was I got, uh, I got a job as a due diligence analyst, um, essentially just a glorified research expert. And what they called portfolio diversification – I will playfully call a lack of focus that caused me to learn a bunch of different topics in a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. And specifically, it was a, a mining opportunity, a, a resource opportunity, followed by a technology opportunity, followed by a biomimetic chemistry opportunity that really solidified for me that uh, the business world – uh, while it may always be a part of things uh, unavoidable, that is not where I wanted my focus and my heart to be. And let so, let me stop I, you for a moment. Pause you. Excuse me. Biomimetic. Yeah, I'll go ahead and I'll I'll break this out. Okay. Right. I, I I don't talk about uh, this this a whole lot because there are a lot of uh, dissenters and uh, to my work and basically if you are. Um, you know, I, I just I don't want to get I don't want any blowback to go to uh, this old company of mine. They're very good friends, and I thank them so much for this. But um, I, I'll, I'll just simply say that while the biggest corporations uh, in terms of the pharmaceutical world are creating ever more exotic and unnatural chemistries to treat things that have side effect lists that are three pages long and they are, you know, 
Class X by the FDA. They're essentially poisons. While all of that is happening, there are a few companies that are going in a different direction and trying to take their cues from nature. The one that I was a part of took its cues from a part of the human immune system, not the adaptive immune system, our, our white blood cells, what most people tend to think of, but our innate immune system. These, are, these consist of things like antimicrobial peptides that you find in a lot of our, our bodily fluids and our mucus and, and, and things like that. And these things, um, unlike something like penicillin, which is not even 100 years old and clinically useless, uh, these days, because all the drugs, I mean, all the pathogens are resistant to it, and we've had to develop new ones. Unlike things like that, since the dawn of humanity, these antimicrobial peptides have been active and they maintain their potency to this day. Well, all they did was they created a chemical that is essentially a, a synthetic mimic of this. Mm. And um, they're taking their cues from the human body, the part that works the best. There's nothing unnatural about it. The same way that our human antimicrobial peptides are positively charged and seek out negative uh, cell membranes of pathogens, our, uh, the, our compounds had a positively charged head group that would um, seek out the negatively charged uh, outer membranes of the bacteria. And then it had a hydrophobic tail that would literally just slice um, <laughs> slice into the bacterial cell, causing blebbing, apoptosis, and eventually cell death. Much like you see just in our in our body when our immune system is working the way it should. Yeah. yeah so that uh, when I when I started to and you know I, I sort of alluded to this, but that is a completely electrostatic reaction. Uh, the, the best part of our innate immune system is these positive uh, positive head groups on the uh, oh, they're called cationic which is another way of saying positive antimicrobial peptides and they seek out the negative uh, membrane proteins and general negative expression of the membranes of bacteria and other pathogens hmm. yeah and so it was that that really solidified for me that I, I didn't need to be running numbers, running accounts, you know, trying to smooth talk people and trying to be Mr. Businessman. I hate wearing a tie. Um, and this is this is just much more me. I, I, I feel like I feel like I've found uh, I found what I want to do. Well, I saw your video from the was it uh, New Mexico conference, and well, you were like wearing a suit and tie, and you look very nice in a suit and tie. So, <laughs> <laughs> don't throw it away yet. <laughs> 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 Anyhow, uh, no, I was actually just the the word you use, biomimetic. I've never heard that one before. Can you? Well, or is uh, that what you just explained? Yeah, well, essentially, if if you slice that word in half, you have bio, which yeah. is, you know, it, it's mim and, and mimic. You know, we're mimicking biology oh. as opposed to trying to create some unnatural, uh, exotic chemistry that you know the FDA may or may not ban because it killed a bunch of people ten years later. This is stuff that we've been living with and has been keeping humans alive for. You know, whether you think that the Earth is 10,000 years old or 4.5 billion years old or, you know, however long you think humans have been here, these antimicrobial peptides have been keeping us alive. Yeah. So this, in my opinion, this was, this is how medicine should be going. Yeah, uh, I agree. But I, I'm, I'm just one man, you know, and I've got, I've got that opinion. Oh, yeah, that's fine. And I would never doubt you or down you for that. Um, I, one thing we didn't talk about before is I spent many years every actually the thing that I actually wanted to do was um and I'd have done it at least to a certain degree is I was a holistic therapist and once I learned uh chi kung which most people equate to martial arts which yes is used in martial arts but it's also used in healing and in the short version of this, I I learned it, and I was using it for healing. Cause I'm six foot two, and 
I was always a big guy, so nobody ever wanted to mess with me, even though I have my martial arts degree. Uh, nobody ever wanted to fight me, so it was nothing that I had to use it for. But I started learning Qigong, but I wasn't learning it for fighting because I never had to use it for fighting. And uh, I went to a Qigong master, and I, but it was uh, for a martial arts school. And I asked him if he could teach me more. And I said, look, I'm just using it for healing. And he looked at me kind of like a puppy does when it's like trying to figure out something. You know, cocks his head to the side. You're using it for healing and you want me to teach you? I said, yes. The guy's from China on top of it. Um, and he says, well, if you're using it for healing, I can't teach you anything more. Well, I was disappointed at the time, but I learned later on. If I could control the energy, this is what he was telling me, basically, is if I could control the energy, I was doing more than what he was teaching in his class. Mm. So, that's interesting. Yeah, it's, that's something we can talk about at another time. But um, let's go from there. Now, you were talking, and uh, I, was, <laughs> I was part of your listening audience when you started the Kickstarter program. And it was kind of funny because you were talking about one day, we're starting a Kickstarter program to get the mobile observatory. And it was about a week or so later, you had all the money that you needed. Wasn't it about that, about that length of time? Yeah, I'd say that's about right. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, about the Kickstarter campaign? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, um, you know, I wasn't even sure that it was going to be the right thing to do at first. Um, I had never done a Kickstarter campaign before. I had, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not big on, on asking people for money. So that was, uh, that was very, very odd. And, you know, I, I felt really comfortable about it, especially because, you know, this, this wasn't people giving money to me. This was people giving money to support a public project that I would just happen to be directing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it was a shock. Uh, to see how fast it happened, um, we had set a goal of thirty-five thousand, and we hit that in just uh, just under th uh, two and a half days. And uh, by the end of the ten or eleven days or so, um, we had just barely eclipsed sixty thousand dollars. So you had your the RV paid for pretty much. Well, you know, um, like I said, my wife and I were part of the suit and tie corporate world, and um, while we are socially liberal on a lot of things, we're very fiscally conservative. We don't believe in spending more money than we had, and we, we were big savers. And so we actually bought the RV ourselves, and whether or not the Kickstarter campaign was successful, we were going to take the show on the road still have these events, still go meet everybody and thank them for supporting us and continuing to support us as as this is really turning a corner now. Mm -hmm. It was really hard when I had to dedicate half of my research efforts in 2011 and 2012 to assuring people that the world was not coming to an end. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that that really just, you can't imagine how difficult it was to make progress in, in other fields during that time. I can imagine. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, so e even if even if this Kickstarter thing hadn't worked, we were going to go around and and do that at this important time when when things are really beginning to come together, which we can talk about more in a little bit. Mm -hmm. But you know, this really allowed us to get you know a lot of equipment for it. It allowed us to um, make a few tune-ups and you know, make it look a lot nicer. It allowed us to outfit it, you know, so that no matter where I am pretty much in the United States, I'll be able to get that daily news out like I have every day for the last three years. Mm -hmm. I, I start to panic if there's, if the lights go out, thinking I might not be able to do the news. <laughs> <laughs> Don't move down to Mexico then. <laughs> I, I must look absolutely ridiculous on the on the heels of a thunderstorm when people are running inside and rushing home to, you know, get inside. I'm sitting on the front porch just praying that, <laughs> that the lightning doesn't come anywhere near me. <laughs> but, um, so, yeah, and we also are going to use the money for um, a lot more gasoline so we can go a lot more places, see a lot more people. Um, 
I, I, these people does these people deserve nothing less than a handshake and a thank you from me to them. Uh, it, it's very <laughs> it's very odd because that's how I see it. And in the two events we've had so far uh, this past weekend in Dayton and last night in Columbus, Ohio, um, it, it seemed like both part both sides of the coin had this just wanting to thank each other and just wanting to meet and talk to each other. And it's, I really am surprised. Uh, I, I knew it would be fun and I knew it wouldn't be a bad time, but I'm surprised at how good these events are turning out. Coming out and just, um, you know, just having these discussions one-on-one, face-to-face uh, and in small groups, it's, this is going to be a really wonderful thing this next year. Mm-hmm. We're just getting started. <laughs> Yeah, I kind of wish sometimes that you were coming down to visit us down in Mexico, but I don't think that would be a good idea. I lack the cojones, Kirk. Huh? I lack the cojones. (laughs) (laughs) Well, especially what you would have to go through in northern Mexico. That's where the biggest problems are, so no, it wouldn't bother. (laughs) I'm already already lamenting the searches of the mobile observatory that are going to come when I go into and come back from Canada. Uh, Canada doesn't sound like it would be such a problem. I mean, I you used know, to... to get into it, probably not. Except, um, you know, they're not going to want me to bring any food, really. Well, uh, that's true. Uh, and but coming back will not be fun. It's never fun trying to get into the United States. Uh, yeah, that's true. One of the reasons why I don't really want to travel up there anymore is just like I'm here, I'm staying here, I'm fine. <laughs> so. <laughs> But, uh, you know, everything's got its own way of dealing with with life, so, yeah, we'll be just fine. Listen, we're going to take a little break here, folks, and uh, we've covered at least the introduction for Ben and what's going on with the Mobile Observatory, and then after this break, we're going to come back. We're going to let Ben just have at it with all the information that he has. Uh, We have about another hour and a half to go, so stay tuned with us, and we'll be right back with my guest, Ben Davidson of Suspicious Observers. Stay tuned. Hi, this is Chad C. Meek of Giant Rock the Movie. You're listening to K6 Radio. And welcome back. We're back with Ben Davison, and now we're just going to get into a lot of the stuff that, as um, Albert Einstein says, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it. So that's why Ben is here, and I'm just asking him questions, because I could not explain most of the things that I'm about to ask him. At (laughs) least, I couldn't explain it to someone who's listening. Okay, so... You, you, every day, Ben, you, you do uh, the segment of Shots of Our Star, mm-hmm. okay, and you're talking about, and you usually end up with the sun anyway, and you're talking about delta spots and umbrals, and I learned from you about these delta spots and umbrals, and can you elaborate what these two particular things are? Well, absolutely. When you see a sunspot, you'll see a dark black center and then a a lighter but darker than the surrounding surface kind of perimeter region to the black sunspot. Now, the parts of the sunspot are that central black umbra and the penumbra surrounding it. And a sunspot always has either a positive or a negative charge. And most often, sunspots don't come just by themselves. They come in sunspot groups, or what they call active regions. And there are these magnetic fields on the sun. They arc up from, in, from the sunspots, out of one into another, always connecting at the sunspot umbras, the, the black part in the center. Mm. And what's interesting is they will only ever connect a positive and a negative to create the the flow, uh, which makes sense because these magnetic fields are carrying uh, charged particles, plasma, and things like that. So it's very much like like the circuit, uh, a maintained flow. 
Now, when you're looking for solar flares, there's actually things you can look for in these sunspot groups that will let you know whether or not it is likely that that sunspot group is going to give you a solar flare. Now, the classifications go very much, um, you know, th this will sound familiar to people. The classifications are alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, the one you asked about. Mm-hmm. The ones we really want to know most about are delta spots, because those are the ones most likely to create X-class solar flares uh, and large coronal mass ejections, the kind of things that could, uh, if big enough, take out uh, the power of almost the entire world, if not the entire world. And what a delta spot is, is when you have both a positive umbra and a negative umbra within the same surrounding penumbral region, there's a very good chance of those magnetic fields interacting in a way that will cause a destabilization that leads to a solar flare. So simply put, the more magnetically mixed a sunspot group is in general, that is, the more tightly compact and uh, the more you know, the more positive and negative is in there writhing around together within the sunspots, the more likely it is that we're going to have a flare. Hmm. And so the only way, so given that solar flares are uh, increasingly becoming known uh, to be an important factor, not just uh, the biggest ones for a potential global blackout event, but even for short-term events, uh, things like storms, climate uh, and other things like that, it's very important to try to figure out when sunspot groups are going to flare and which sunspot groups are going to flare. And to do that, you have to go delta hunting, as I like to say. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to look for delta spots. And to do that, you have to be focused on the umbras of the sunspots, looking at their magnetics, uh, looking at their polarity, positive and negative. Hmm. Well, I notice you do that every day on your show anyway, uh, towards, especially towards the end of the show. Uh, you're talking about the incoming limb and the outgoing limb and what's happening. This is what really interests me in that. Um, before I actually continue on with this, I want to ask you a question that's always bothered me, and I've never, as you were saying when you were at Penn State, I never got an answer because it seems like people either skirt the question or it just, whatever. But then again, it's not like I've been asking a lot of people anyway. But uh, you on occasion on your show, I call it a show, but your news program every morning, because that's what you call it, news, uh, for five minutes. You get a lot of information from you in five minutes. But... Um, People are busy, Kirk. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> well, no, I like it because it's just I can get a lot of information in five minutes. I don't have to sit there and going, oh, okay, would you get on with this? You know, one yeah. person we were talking about before we got into the interview. But anyhow, the question basically is you on occasion show there's a comment or there's something that actually just dives right into the sun. Correct. Yeah. Uh, the sun is basically a great big nuclear reactor, which means it has to be fed. Now, it has been my opinion, which we know how opinions go. Um, there's an expression that I can't say on the air, but anyway, um, you know, opinions in blank is like everybody's got one. But anyway, um, my opinion is, is that the sun is being fed by meteors, comets, asteroids, whatever, space debris, put it that way. Would that be correct, incorrect, or what? Well, for anybody to tell you with certainty, yes or no, right. they'd be lying. We, we simply c couldn't possibly hope to know the answer. Mm -hmm. But theoretically, it's coming from a very good place, y your opinion. Mm -hmm. Now... I tend to lean towards the externally powered theories of the sun. Uh, I do believe there are nuclear reactions at the core, uh -huh. um, but that the majority of what we see on our star is a chemical, uh, an electrochemical reaction. Um, 
just really simply, just like the Earth is a sphere magnet with a north and south pole, so is the sun. All the planets are. Mm -hmm. And while those create magnetic shields that can shield from outside energy, at the exact north and the exact south, they are inducing a direct current because you have a north force one way and a south force the other way. It's the same thing that a real magnet does. It's just a, in the in the shape of a sphere, and it's mm -hmm. inducing the current, the magnetic field, through it that way. So, um, but d despite the thoughts of that, regardless of whether you are a pure mainstream nuclear furnace sun, or you're one of the new electric universe theorists, and I do have to say new electric universe theorists because people hear electric universe theories and they think, oh, are you talking about that the ether? That's that's the old uh, electric universe theories, and I think that at some point the newer ones will begin to lament even choosing a name that comes close to it. But um, it, it, regardless of which which side you're on, it's very very clear that these comets can are you know they're material and they're destabilizing agents for for the sun. Uh, we often see solar flares while sun-diving comets. That's what we call them, sun-diving and sun-grazing comets. Mm -hmm. They seem to induce solar flares. And when you, when you spend some time looking at the sun, uh, Kirk, I'm not sure if you've seen how I show the big, the big arcs, the magnetic field arcs that come up off of the sun. Mm-hmm. Well, those are just the ones that are close to the sun. They have there are fields that are pretty much everywhere in between there and out to the edge of the heliosphere past Pluto. Hmm. And when this comet comes in, and especially if it breaks up, that means that it's going to be heated, charged, exploded, bombarded with solar wind electrified and most likely captured in one of those magnetic fields or multiple magnetic fields of the sun. It's like an extra surge that goes through the system. Um, and so whether that's purely electrical or, you know, there's the matter fuel element to it, I couldn't tell you, but I will, I do know this, the, the comets that sun grays that, that don't dive and don't die, uh, the ones that survive, mm -hmm. don't seem to induce as much flaring. And if you think about it, it makes sense. Matter is very, 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 very condensed energy. And if the comet survives, it's taking most of that energy out with it. But if the comet breaks up into dust, electrified dust, and gets captured and sent back into the stellar system, Mm -hmm. you know, the, the stellar magnetic system, then all that energy that had once been condensed into matter is now a part of the sun, which leaves us right at what you started this with. Could these things be charging up or fueling up the sun? And th most of the people are, are going to be coming that way. A lot of people in the community already lean that way. Okay. Well, I was thinking about it because it's like, um, well... I, I liken it to the fact that, okay, uh, an object hits anything that's liquid, and that's how I see the sun, and you get this, you have this one particular part of a video, I think it's your sun cycle um, videos that you just put up about a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. and I think it's in there, but you have the shot of the sun it looks like a great big ball of gold and black. Just it's liquid. It's just moving back and forth. Well, you know, there's. Uh, I don't suppose you'd mind if I could get a s slightly controversial in a positive way, do oh, you? Please go for it. All right. Tiny little bit of background. There's a man here in Columbus, Ohio. He's a professor of radiology, uh, head of the radiology department at the Ohio State University. When he wanted to put eight Tesla magnets in an MRI machine and, you know, absolutely stomp on the world's uh, record for nuclear magnetic resonance imaging, mm -hmm. they told him it was impossible. And he said, no, you've got a couple of basic physics principles wrong, and I'm going to do it anyway. Well, he did it, and 
he's changed the world. Um, people who get MRIs now, um, if anybody's ever had an MRI or a scan like that that's ended, ended up finding something that has helped save their life, you can thank him. And he's now turned that revelation he had about some basic physics principles onto everything else that have used those basic physics principles in order to come to their conclusions. It's mostly based off of Kirchhoff's law of black body radiation. And without getting too complex, the reason why he was able to create this machine was because Kirchhoff's law as it exists is not incorrect, but it's incorrectly applied to other places. And one of those places it's applied is the sun. And under the new paradigm, the paradigm of Dr. Pierre-Marie Robitaille, the man from Ohio State, hmm. the sun is liquid. Liquid metallic hydrogen. Hmm. In fact, uh, if you just type in liquid metallic hydrogen sun I, into a, any internet search, I'm quite sure you'll find him quickly. He was actually at the uh, the Electric Universe Conference in New Mexico this past March. He he spoke the day after I did, mm -hmm. when I was wearing that suit and tie. Yeah. He said liquid metallic... Liquid metallic hydrogen. Hydrogen. Um, I actually, when he first started putting these out, and I, I realized just how on point they were, I had a video... Um, and I think I called it the sun is liquid with a question mark at the end. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, this is, it's not liquid like we think of our oceans. Um, yeah. But this man is going, to, and what he has done with Kirchhoff's law not only has significant implications for the sun being a liquid, it has very, very significant uh, implications for the cosmic microwave background and, um, the origin of the universe in general. I'm going to pause you on that one, so I do want to come back to Robotai, but I don't have any questions on that. I want you to expand on that one if you don't mind. But just to kind of go on this one before I lose the thought, because I know I'll end up coming back to it later and I've got to be going, what is he talking about now? <laughs> okay. But... Uh, the One of the theories that I have, now like I said, I'm not a scientist, I'm just looking at it and just trying to reason it out, is that, now, I could be definitely wrong, and this is one of the reasons why I want to ask you, because if if I'm wrong, I have a feeling you might know this, okay? And that's probably just going on a negative, but we'll just deal with it. Um, I always akin the sunspots to incoming material. I don't care what you want to call it. It's cab, an asteroid, a comet, a meteorite, whatever, hitting the sun. And the dark spots. Now, this is probably way far-fetched wrong, but I'm going to go for it anyway. Um, it's like adding an ice cube, in my opinion, to something that is really, really hot. And that little piece of cold rock in comparison to the sun that is uh, it hits and it's going to cool down that region until it actually starts it the heat picks it up and starts burning it like throwing in a piece of wood on a campfire uh, that little spot right there is going to be cooler because it hasn't picked up the heat from the surrounding fire now if that's my theory am I wrong or am I right or somewhere in between well, um, the, the symmetry that we see sunspots having sometimes, and they're sometimes lasting just a few hours and some other times lasting days on end, mm -hmm. I think it would be feasible that an increase or a decrease in the amount of sunspots you see could be um, related to these bodies on approach. But the ch the the chances of these things ever actually getting down to where we see the sunspots mm -hmm. are virtually nil. The the areas that they have to go through, mm -hmm. um, we really just don't see. And I, I'm not sure if I'm understanding correctly um, what you mean. So are you saying that 
the idea would be that something would hit the sun and then, um, you know, cool it down right there. Yeah, like I said, it's something, well, my idea, and that's what I said, I'm opening this up because I have no idea, you know, and I'm just putting it out there, so if somebody's out there going, the guy's an idiot, okay, fine, I'm an idiot, but I'm asking I a question. Huh? I would think it would heat it up. Well, yeah, I'm thinking of long lines of, like I said, you're at a campfire or whatever, uh, or even if you just have, you're doing a barbecue in your backyard. Whatever is going to hit that existing fire is going to be cooler, and of course, as it approaches, it's going to pick up some heat. Ah. How much heat? I don't know. How dense is it? I don't know. But once it hits the sun, would it cause a cooler spot, which would be the dark area, until it actually heats up, depending, as you said, how big it is or how small it is? If we had a comet that was completely full of ice, it was just literally a giant ice ball, Uh hit the planet, as it hit, it would cause so much heat and, uh, I mean, just explosive heat. Mm -hmm. The the speed that these things are traveling. Um, If something is going to end up crashing into the sun before it actually gets there, it's going to be going thousands and, you Mm -hmm. know, hundreds of thousands of miles an hour. Instead of going through, you know, neutral, you know, relatively neutral atmosphere, like what happened here on Earth, it's going through highly charged plasmas and magnetic fields and solar wind and things like that. Right. I think I'd probably have a tough time getting my head around that one. I do know that there's a very good chance that sunspots have a lot to do with the planets. Uh-huh. That that um well, we're going to get into that in a little bit. But <laughs> <laughs> now, I was just curious, uh, like I said, I'm asking more than I'm trying to bring up a debate. Because I, I would actually like to have an answer to this. And um, one of the reasons why I think this is because, as we know, there is, and I don't always know the names, but the Oort Belt or the debris belt that surrounds our uh, solar system. It's supposed to be just full of broken up pieces of rock, just for lack of anything else. Uh, some of it just hangs out there, and I would assume, assumptions being what they are, uh, on from time to time, these rocks, space rocks, whatever, space debris, actually gets pulled in. But since they don't have any uh, light quality of their own, how much of that would we actually see hitting the sun? And that's where my speculation comes in. I'm just, is this... And, you know, the only, as my father used to tell me, the only dumb question is the one you didn't ask. So I'm just putting it out there and seeing, do you have a... Oh, here's, a here's, here's something interesting. Uh-huh. If indeed the, the sunspots uh, are connected with, you know, mag- the interplanetary magnetic field lines that go out to the, the planets, then there absolutely is material traveling along those electromagnetic pathways, often called Birkeland currents. And so there would be material either striking or leaving the star at that point, because that's what you have to remember. Mm-hmm. There's the positives and the negatives. It's not just, and you know, sometimes the current flow is outward, sometimes it's inward. But here's something to think about. At sunspot minimum, when there's not really a whole lot of sunspots, the magnetic fields of the star are aligned north and south, pretty much like you would think they should be in a sphere magnet. Mm -hmm. But did you know that the sun flips its magnetic poles every 11 years? Yes. Every solar cycle. And, you know, this isn't doom and gloom. It's happened multiple times in our lives already. Mm -hmm. Um, But as that happens, the polar alignment, north-south, vertical, if you will, uh, if you're just trying to picture it in your head, begins to flip. And it doesn't do it instantaneously. It does it at a couple of years um, every 11 years or so, it takes you know anywhere from a couple of months to a couple of years. This one's taking quite a long time. Yeah. But what happens is that the, that polar alignment slowly starts to not be so polar. And all of a sudden, as it gets down towards the, the mid-latitudes, 
you start to see the magnetic field lines actually popping out of the surface in the sunspots. They go in a, you know, one charged sunspot and they come out another one. And when the reversal is compl- uh, is you know happened like that, you know, the reversal is actually done. Mm-hmm. The positive and negative um, leading of the sunspot groups flips. And what I mean by that is when you see multiple sunspots on the sun, one sunspot will only lead in one hemisphere, whether it's, uh, you know, positive in the north, negative in the south, or positive in the south and negative in the north. Mm -hmm. During that time when you're seeing the sunspots, it stays that way. Only one polarity leads every group on the north versus the south hemisphere. Well, I've just mentioned that when the polar alignment breaks and the fields aren't north and south anymore and they start to creep down towards the equator on their way to uh, flipping, Mm -hmm. they start to pop out of the surface, and this is where we see the sunspots. Uh... And the way you know that the flip is complete is because all of a sudden you see sunspots leading in the wrong hemisphere. All of a sudden, if positive had been leading for you know, a little over a decade in the north, and all of a sudden negative is leading in the north and positive is leading in the south, you can be pretty sure that the poles have flipped. And after that time, they will continue on the direction they have been going, um, and they will end up at the poles for a completely reversed polar alignment. Uh. And so what's interesting is while the sunspots are actually there, while, while there's no polar alignment of the magnetic fields, that's actually the weakest polar time for the sun. But it's the sunspot maximum. And when there are no sunspots at all, what we consider to be the quiet sun, that is when is at, it is at polar maximum, at maximum polar force. Huh. Just a couple interesting little tidbits about the star. Definitely. I learned more. This is why you're on the show today. Anyway, <laughs> um, while you were talking about this, I do, wanted to, I do want to get into this question, and we've got some time before we go into our next break. Um, you were talking about magnetic fields anyway, and then I want to get into, I'm going to put this together, see if we can do this and this. If we're not, we'll come back after the break and we'll continue. Uh, the strong and weak magnetic fields, how that affects the Earth. You made mention of that recently in uh, one of your videos, talking about uh, when we are... Uh, how did you actually put that? I think it was just two days ago when you were saying that uh, we're going to a, a solar minimum. And if you're one who is afraid of um, sunspots, oh, you may okay. think that's a good idea, but it's actually not. And then you brought it into how that's going to affect the weather in very strange conditions. Yes, well, um, start with a quick tidbit. Uh, as, as you may have guessed, since there is this 11-year cycle with sunspots versus no sunspots, and we know that the sunspots are what causes flaring, there uh, is you know, pretty much an up and down flow to the solar flaring, just like there is to the sunspots, and it's about an 11-year cycle. Well, solar flares expand the upper atmosphere, and it's this nice 11-year equilibrium-like dance where during sunspot minimum, the atmosphere collapses a bit, and then solar maximum pumps it back up. And it, it's, a very, it's almost like a, a long-term breath or pulse of, of the planet in that way. And after being uh, very, very active for the you know for about 50 years or so, the sun has begun weakening faster than at any other time that we, uh, that we can guess based on historical record reconstruction in the last 9,000 years. At no point has it ever been weakening faster than it's weakening right now. Now, you asked about the the solar minimum, or I think you were talking about the solar grand minimum. There's, in addition to the 11-year sunspot cycle, there's 
uh, 22-year cycles, 70-year cycles that um, slightly modulate flaring and things like that. But there are there's an approximately 400-year cycle as well. Uh, it varies a little bit from that. And it's called the grand solar cycle. And just like the shorter 11-year cycles, there is a grand solar maximum and there is a grand solar minimum. The last grand solar minimum was about 400 years ago. It was during the 1600s. And this, uh, this is actually what capped off the last mini ice age. And the modern maximum of solar activity for the last 400 years was from 1950 to the year 2000 or 2001, 2002, 2003, that area there. But since then, the sun has been weakening very, very quickly. Hmm. Now, uh, it just, just out of curiosity, do you know anything that happened between 1950 and 2003 that was it, while the sun was at its modern maximum of the last 400 years? Mm, are you talking about it from a personal experience or something um, I may have read? Uh, I'm thinking. I'm thinking in terms of the prime time of global warming. <sighs> well, when, I lived through most of that area, so most of my memory is going to come from that. Um, well, you know, it, it, it's okay. I, I, I kind of answered the question. You know, there's there's a saying in climate science that they say that it's it's a constant star that you know there's a solar constant and the sun doesn't have any effect on on the planet and the temperatures and the climate yeah right however <laughs> this uh their efforts uh do three things one they only focus on um one measure of irradiance they don't look back past 1880, and mm -hmm. um, they also say that it must be due to the 11-year cycle. That's the only thing we can look for. And based on those restrictions and how they've set it up, you know, you can't look at the 22, you can't look at the 70, you can't look back to the last grand minimum, you can't even look on grand minimum cycles – they say you just have to look at 11-year cycles. And mm -hmm. uh, based on that, they have decided that the sun is not a factor in climate change. However, the last couple global famines and cold waves that lasted multi-decades on the planet occurred during solar grand minimum. And the most outrageous global warming we have found on record, we've experienced from 19... Uh, about 1940, the late 1940s, uh, through the early 2000s, about the time when the Earth, quote, paused its warming, as they like to say. Uh, it's actually been cooling since then, technically. Um, but we'll go ahead and we'll call it a pause for now. Uh, during that time of rapid growth, that is undisputed. That is the grand solar maximum of this cycle. And, uh, you know, th these aren't this isn't me saying this. This is you go to NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center and you find the sunspot chart that goes back to the last grand minimum. NASA's not shy about this, by the way. They, they'll, they'll show you the sunspot numbers from the last grand minimum during the last mini ice age. And they'll show you how much higher the sunspot numbers were from – it was actually – it actually started to ramp up in 1900, interestingly enough, but the actual, we can't call that full 100-year period of only a 400-year cycle the maximum. It, the absolute max of this time was really 1950 to early 2000s. And since then, we have the strongest weakening in the last 9,000 years. Hmm. So what is that? Uh, you made a, an allusion to that just yesterday or the day before. Uh, what do we, as you speculate from, and I'm using the word speculate, listeners, because so far whenever I hear Ben say something and he calls, um, he calls for, uh, for some people I would just say make it, he makes a prediction. So far he has been right on the money as the expression goes, so... 
this is why I, I invited him and I trust his, his uh, I'll say, opinions or his learned opinions on this. So what do you think is, uh, you alluded to this the other day, but what do you think we're in tune for or coming up to as far as our experience here on this little blue-green planet? Well, the first thing that uh, probably should, uh, the first thing that should be the foundation of this ex- of the answer to that question is the fact that cavemen survived this mm-hmm. people came to the americas during the last one mm-hmm. this isn't doom and gloom the world's not coming to an end from this however the global famines on record the accounts from you know some people want to say historical accounts uh i will say historical and even ancient accounts um uh, tell stories of weather events that we just know nothing of today. We, we haven't seen these things in hundreds of years. Um, nobody's written about them or talked about them in hundreds of years. These aren't things that ended the world. But these were things that, you know, were so shocking and so out of the ordinary that people came up with pretty ridiculous explanations for them. Um, you know, everything from sea monsters to aliens to returns of God and things like that. I mean, you can go and you can see that the only thing these people really agreed on was that they all saw something absolutely asinine happen to them. And it's only now that we have the ability to, you know, do these historical reconstructions and try to figure out what was going on back then. But it's, um, you know, it's not doomsday, but it's it's going to it's going to be kind of rough and i think the worst of it is really the agricultural aspect you know there were famines back in the day when everything was sustainable you know everything was local mm-hmm. i go to my local grocery store right now and i mean in just one shelf in front of me I've got strawberries and blueberries and a couple other berries from eight different countries mm-hmm. just sitting in front of me. Why, why do I have that? Um, you know, the way that we grow and ship and store food all around this planet doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Mm-hmm. And um, we're fairly vulnerable to that. I don't know if um, – I don't know how you're going to feel about me shooting you a link in the middle of our Skype conversation, but it will actually help with the discussion. Um, I just sent you a link to an article that came out uh, just a couple of days ago. Coldest night in 50 years brings June snow to Finland. Hmm. You know, there were frost warnings in late May in many parts of the United States. There was actually frost in Canada. There are parts of uh, the Northwest right now, actually, that are getting some snowflakes, all the while we are expected to have a 100-degree heat here in the eastern part of the United States. You know, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you for a hot second here. You reminded me of something. My father was born in 1919. Okay. And he told me that he remembered, when he was a child, seeing snow in July. And he was from the upper Midwest, not too far from where you are. Yeah. Wow. That's not something I've. Uh, that's not something I've ever heard of. That's that's really fascinating. A little scary. <laughs> People, stay with us. We'll be right back with Ben Davidson of Suspicious Observers. Stay tuned. Do you need a website or a webmaster for your business or hobby, a wordsmith for a research project or for a script, an article, or even a language translator? Do you need an audio or visual project created or edited? Contact K-Wave 6 Productions at www.kwave6productions.tk for all of your website, writing, and audio and visual needs. Our rates are competitive and our services are excellent. That's K-Wave 6 Productions at www.kwave6productions.tk Or email us 
at info at kwave6productions.tk. Hi, this is Pat Kammer. I'm the author of Love's Voice Changes You, Book One, and this is K Wave 6 Radio. Hello and welcome back to K-Wave 6 Radio. Today my guest is, if you haven't been here for the first hour, it is Ben Davidson of Suspicious Observers. Uh, We were talking about a particular subject uh, before break and uh, before we continue on with the rest of our interview for the remaining hour, uh, Ben said he wanted to say something uh, to close a particular thought. Ben? Absolutely. Absolutely. I gave a lot of reasons why uh, we should be looking at the sun for solar activity and how some of the longer historical accounts than are used in current climate models suggest that we could be in for uh, not just these heat events and these these uh, sea level rise events, but also cold events as well. This is really climate extremes of every kind, and that would be a much better descriptive of it than just global warming. But, you know, despite the fact that the IPCC, the the main climate change body, uh, despite the fact that their projections have been kind of embarrassingly inaccurate for 20 years, and I say I'm included in that embarrassment because I was part of the... It's all CO2. It's global warming. Uh, This is all our fault. I was part of that train. Um, Even after we found out that our projections were woefully inaccurate. However, what I found out next while I was trying to go back to the drawing board and I was looking at things like the sun is that most of the people who were towing that line before refused to admit that there was anything wrong with our models. They refused to admit that we had gotten it dead wrong for decades. And any time somebody questioned it, uh, questioned it or suggested that more needed to be done, they would be called a climate change denier or, you know, oh, they're just bought by oil. This includes me, people who towed the line there. Uh, and if anything, I was I, – not doing my own diligence enough for the, all those years when I just bought into it. And the point is, quite clearly, climate change is very, very real. That's what the, you know, the big part of that first discussion was about. This isn't about denying climate change. When it comes to whether or not pollution has the major role, I don't think that that has anything to do with regulation or deregulation, I'm not, you know, if I were to come to the conclusion that humans have no effect on the weather and it's all the sun 100%, which I, I haven't come to that conclusion, I think that every input into a system has an effect. But even if I were to come to such an extreme conclusion, there are enough health reasons to regulate polluters far more than they're already regulated. I mean, the effects on the respiratory central nervous system and the endocrine system, especially in human children, uh, it, it's it's heartbreaking. And that doesn't even begin to talk about deforestation or what we do to, you know, the other flora and fauna life here on this planet. And so this isn't about ignoring climate change or climate science. And this isn't about deregulation because the people blaming CO2 have gotten it wrong for so long. This is about the fact that there are billions of dollars spent worried about global warming and there's nothing spent and there's no effort spent worrying about what happens if we enter a solar grand minimum, which has been predicted to happen from a number of different uh, sources anytime within the next 10 to the next 70 years which is a far shorter time frame than most of the global warming projections, even the ones that have been proven to be uh, wrong for 20 years in, uh, and wrong in terms of overreaching. So they're saying what could happen in 100 years or so. 
based on that, they were overreaching. So we're, we're really talking about much more imminent things here. And, you know, as we saw, it snowed in Finland two nights ago in June. And there were frost warnings in the United States in late May. Speaking with local farmers here in Columbus, uh, they managed to pull out an okay harvest. Most of them did last year, but they had to wait to plant. It was delayed, and the drought really caused them to have to put more money into getting the crop to fruition. And so these are things that they can't have happen every year, and they definitely can't have it be worse than it was last year. Um, This year, luckily, at least in my part of the world, the rain has been very, very plentiful. We haven't had a ton of big storms. The thunderstorms we have had have not produced much hail. It's, I, I mean, I, I'd like to think that apart from some of the cold that lasted a little longer than we would have liked, it's going to be a pretty good summer for Ohio farmers. Um, it's just a matter of what happens when it's not. What happens when that snow is... Uh, and those frost events are in June or July, and it's down to Oklahoma. Then we have a very, very big problem. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the issue is we have billions spent on worrying about heat, and we don't talk or worry or expend any effort worrying about the other side. I'm not even saying stop worrying about the heat. I would like uh, a one-to-one dollar spent by the government uh, – even a 10 to 1 dollar spend in favor of global warming is more than enough to adequately map out and plan for some of these cold events there is so much we can do and as i said earlier this isn't doomsday by a by a stretch uh, people in wooden boats came to uh, this country from europe during the last maunder minimum uh, lucky, lucky for them, they didn't have to grow very much, and the oceans are the great modifier of extreme events, and so they didn't uh, have to, to feel it so badly. But um, you know, so it, it's not it's not so negative, it's not so scary. It's just there are there are ways we have to right the ship. Uh, the people who used to be on my side and who have now kind of turned on me, uh, they need to admit that they're not perfect, that they've made some mistakes. I look at it from Winston Churchill's way of putting it. This is uh, paraphrasing it. This is people hate you. Good. It means you stand for something. So Ben, as far as I'm concerned, keep standing. I'm with you on it. So not a problem. Uh, you're never going to get everybody in the world to agree with you anyway. There is no such thing. I if, uh, if you're finished with that. I'm going to throw out some topics I hope they're all related. I just want to let you expound on them. Uh, They were just from what you were just talking about. And um, here they go. You were talking about the IPCC, if you wouldn't mind explaining that one a little bit more. Uh, Then we're talking about, uh, I pulled this up because Al Gore got in there and he made this big thing about climate Was it global heating, I guess it was, Uh, some time ago? And he's talking about, uh, was it getting rid of carbon emissions? Yes, I agree with you that whatever we put into a system is going to have some effect on that. And we're going to come back to that one because we were talking about that offline some time ago. About Fukushima radiation and how it affects the weather, etc., etc., um, but they were using this for the global warming thing uh, because they wanted to use this for taxing carbon emissions. Mm-hmm. In other words, it's another way for governments and corporations to collect more money from us. So it's beneficial financially to say, yes, there's global warming and uh, we're going to tax you on it because you drive a car or you use... Uh, cold-fired, generated uh, electricity, whatever the case may be. But even before that, uh, I used to, I told you before when we were talking, before we got on air, I was always had an interest in in the climate, not as you did for studying meteorology and all the rest of that, but I have basically a layman's way of looking at it. Uh, But there was also the reports back around those times that Al Gore was out there talking about global warming. And 
there were many things written and videos put out about the planetary, uh, our planets and our solar system heating up and ice caps of both those uh, planets have warmed and uh, have melted away. These one or two of the spots on Jupiter have disappeared since then and all that. Um, and then you talk about, um, even in some of your videos, the Earth is heating from the core, you know, because you even talk about it from Antarctica. Yes, the snow and the ice is forming on the surface uh, in record record amounts, but the ice is melting from beneath. And, oh, yeah, that's it. That's the final thing. So I'm going to let you run with that one. Well, I'm not sure if I can remember all of that. While <laughs> well, I'm in the middle of talking, but I, I guess we'll start with the IPCC. Okay. The IPCC, um, I don't know, uh, I'd like to think it began as an effort to truly investigate the effects of climate change, um, except uh, I have to even be skeptical that there was even a benign genesis to it, because right from the get-go, um, they defined uh, climate variability as anything natural and climate change as anything man-made. That was the definitions in the very first IPCC report. And when they, and so when you realize what they're saying, when they say we are 97, we're, we're 90 whatever percent sure that climate change is real and humans are the cause. Well, if you've determined it's real, by definition, we better be the cause. Otherwise, uh, that's that's some some strange uh, vocabulary on their part. But you know, let's just take the the notion that at one point it was a genuine effort to figure out what's going on. I hate to say that I was on the side that was essentially used for propaganda, but I, uh, me and everybody else like me who bought into this really was just helping uh, push this propaganda. And it's come down to the point where, you know, it was one thing when a decade ago we started to hear a few scientists come out saying that their papers were left out or censored because they took a different view. And there was absolutely nothing wrong with the papers whatsoever. Or how some scientists would get uh, blacklisted or blackballed from different groups or uh, their co-authors would um, refuse to be part of papers with them. They would lose their jobs. They would have their funding threatened. And these started happening more and more to the point where um, while the one side had stopped giving new evidence and was trying to explain away this pause in global warming and their failed projections and calling uh, people climate deniers and censoring uh censoring papers that didn't go along with uh with what they were you know trying to push this comes right back to what you were saying about how there's a lot of money at stake here mm -hmm. uh, they're from their perspective and from the perspective of the right um which i would like to clearly differentiate myself from uh as well i i definitely standing in the middle of both of the sides of this climate fight you know for the other side to take a, some mistakes of imperfect humans trying to understand the most complex problem we've ever faced and using that to try to argue for greedy ends uh, is just ridiculously immoral. And by greedy ends, I mean they're arguing for deregulation and saying, ah, oh, we shouldn't be worried about pollution. And I gave the reasons why we should. Mm -hmm. So that is almost what this has devolved into. We have one side who, you know, the right, if you will, uh, and, and I'll just talk about it in terms of uh, political economics. Um, the right has some true facts about the climate and how we've been looking at it, but they're using it for to argue for these really, and I don't want to say evil ends, but it's it just doesn't jive with my morality or my values. The way that it, see, it seems just very greedy. And then you have the other side who wants a clean planet. Um, I'm with them 100% on regulating these polluters. But at the same time, they are lying to them. They're lying to 
everybody else, if not to each uh, uh, themselves at this point. Um, the fact that we could have happen what we've just had happen, this unbelievable failure of the projections, and indeed the the planetary temperature going the other direction, and they just claim ever more certainty and seek to squelch any opposition by calling them climate deniers. Uh, stuff like the president's speech, uh, graduation speech a couple of days ago, it was a divisive action, did nothing to bring us together and did nothing to forward climate understanding and climate science. It only forwarded the propaganda uh, and the, the taxes and the agenda at play. And it, uh, it's really disappointing. And I, I have, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll, I'll admit it. It's embarrassing that I was on that side with righteous indignation. I was calling people climate deniers. I was I was that bad guy that I talk about now. Well, I just I just didn't realize it. I, I look at it this way: life is about growth and change, which is part of what the show is all about. Anyway, it's about growth and change. You learn something while you were there, and you're not the same person today that you were yesterday or back then. So you've came you've come to some sort of understanding, and you made it the appropriate change. So anybody wants to judge you for what you were back then, just say, I learned something back then that I probably wouldn't have learned any other way. Yeah. I'll, I'll go ahead and blame it on youth. Okay. <laughs> Works for you. That's fine. <laughs> but anyhow, um, getting back, I know you don't remember all the questions, but uh, let's just hit the topics here. Um, planetary heating. Uh, Let's see. Ice caps on other planets heating uh, during Al Gore's uh, global heating thing and Antarctic ice melting from below while the ice on top is building up phenomenally. Absolutely. Um, Well, let's talk about some of the other planets because one thing's for sure. If the sun has a major role in what's happening right now, When we look around the solar system, we had better see evidence of changes everywhere, Mm -hmm. right? So, it's kind of tough to see any meteorological changes on Mercury. However, on Venus, the fastest winds have gotten 25% faster. At this point, we're still trying to quantify if our storms have gotten any stronger. We have had some singular events like the strongest typhoon on record, the strongest tornado to hit the United States. But I'm talking about on average sustained. Um, and it, the number is actually 25 to 33 percent faster, uh, the fastest winds on Venus. So imagine if there were, you know, uh, up to 350 or 400 mile per hour tornadoes, 300 mile per hour hurricanes. These are. Uh, you know, th- th- this is scary stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, we haven't seen anything close to that here on Earth. Oh, and Venus's rotation speed has actually changed from what it was 16 years ago. Haven't had that happen on Earth yet. Up until the time that um, Earth had this pause in warming, there was this dead heat, <laughs> pun, in, pun not really intended, <laughs> between Earth and Mars. Mars was technically winning. Uh, Mars was heating up much faster than the Earth was during that time. And we go out to Jupiter. As you said, Jupiter, uh, the the big red storm, uh, began to fade and weaken. We had a new one pop up. Uh, we, we monitor storms, hundreds of them all the time on Jupiter. We don't usually name them, uh, name them, but this one got the name Red Junior. And we saw one of the entire planetary stripes virtually disappear. Uh Furthermore, um, we've been monitoring the radio emissions of the planets uh, for decades. I mean, John Nelson at RCA made a, you know, made a life on this uh, and on the sun. But recently, Jupiter began emitting a new radio frequency. Zeus got tired of his old tune and he decided to start singing a new one. Hmm. Um, We haven't seen anything like a a mega superstorm on Earth or, you know, 
a change in one of the planetary cloud bands or something like that. We certainly haven't seen anything like that on Earth. On Saturn, they have this cyclical storm. It happens once every 30 years. Or so we thought. We had been able to see it in satellites every 30 years, and 10 years early, we just got the last one. It lasted longer than anyone we had ever seen and was way more intense than expected. This would be like the largest hurricane in the history of the planet hitting the east coast of the United States on January 1st and staying there until spring. Haven't, Haven't seen anything like that on Earth yet. Now, you get out to Uranus, Neptune. Uh, there are some changes we can see. It's a little harder to tell. Um, we've been looking at Uranus for a very long time, but in the last couple of years, we actually were able to just finally see the auroras. So it got juiced up enough uh, for its auroral activity, uh, its northern lights, if you will, mm-hmm. to be seen from, from an Earth-orbiting satellite. And so you look around the solar system and... You know, the sun is weakening faster than at any point in the last 9,000 years after it being at the modern maximum. You have to ask yourself, is Earth the least changing body in our neck of the woods? Are, are, all, these, are all these other planets and the sun itself changing faster and changing more than Earth? Saturn's another one. Its, its rotation speed has changed as well in the last couple of years. Faster or slower? Slower. Huh? Mm-hmm. And so, these, these really bring into perspective uh, the need to at least investigate these longer-term solar cycles and investigate whether maybe we should be looking uh, at more than just one type of irradiance uh, from the sun and things like that. Let's see if we can get to a short question and answer here before we go into our last break of the show. Um, You were talking about changes on the solar system scale, not just on our planetary scale. Uh, How about uh, just in the last couple of years, let's just go out that far at least, at least the last two years, where there have been tornadoes in Italy, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, the ones that really got my attention was these chain of tornadoes that going from basically the Canadian border to the uh, border of Mexico and to the uh, Gulf of Mexico in the United States. Those are some strange things that are going on. What do you think of those? Well, that's, um, that's directly related to exactly what I think um, is the essence of our climate change. It's an electromagnetic shift. What happens when the sun is losing its energy? Where is it going? Oh, take a look at the planets. There it is. Our planet is having heat events in addition to these cold events we're getting. We're getting more extreme drought, more extreme flood, more extreme everything. But most importantly, and at the foundation of all of that which we consider practically affecting our lives is the pressure. The pressure system differentials are getting wider. The lows are lower, the highs are higher. This is causing a stronger drive on the surface wind, pulling more heat and moisture in one way, pulling cooler, drier air in from another direction, and you know this is just basic chemistry and things like that. When you have rapid change that's what releases energy and what we're doing is we're slamming hotter wetter air into drier cooler air and they're having to work out their differences above our heads and we feel the effects of it down below Mm -hmm. and as as the lows get really really strong some of these really powerful ones that you know drop 20 30 50 tornadoes in a night you know, the, those are ones where you don't see those long horizontal storms moving across the country. It looks like this knuckle, this knuckling system is just, it almost looks like a hurricane on land. 
and the storm line goes north to south as opposed to east to west. These are these are storm systems that are going to be more and more um, more and more prevalent as the pressure differential grows. This is and you know this is why if it seemed like I don't and I don't know how much of this you have down in Mexico, but this has really been true for the United States. We will see really unseasonable heat, then phenomenally bad storms, and then it'll actually be cooler than it should be for that time of year. Oh, and that's because the low pressure systems are getting stronger. They're pulling up, and you know, if you're looking down uh, on a map of the United States and there's a low pressure cell, it's going to look like it's driving the wind counterclockwise around it, sucking in. Uh, which is what causes those convergences. It causes them to smash together as they all suck in there. But what you'll see is, and if you can picture counterclockwise motions, you know, on top of the United States, mm-hmm. on the leading edge of it, the east edge, it's going to be pulling heat and moisture from the Gulf. Then in the center, you're going to have the storms. And then on the other side of it, counterclockwise brings air down, you know, from Canada where it's a lot cooler. And so this is this is the cause of these extreme swings. It's all a matter of there's more energy creating more pressure differential in our atmosphere. And you know, e- even things as simple as, you know, you can look at any low pressure system in the northern hemisphere and it's going to suck in counterclockwise at the ground level. The high pressure systems will push out clockwise. Those are flipped in the southern hemisphere the lows still suck in and the highs still push out but the lows spin clockwise and the highs spin counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere and this is um, just this really really simple way of seeing temperature and colliding air masses and things like that this is not what's taught in meteorology or at least it wasn't when I was doing my meteorology classes it's Simple things like this, and of course, you know, this one thing isn't the reason why I became, um, you know, why I fell out of love with meteorology, but it was things like this, uh, insisting on looking at, you know, spreadsheet after spreadsheet of numbers and models and math that, you know, somebody else created, and they're spitting out these uh, these figures and these other charts, when all you really have to do is take a look at the pressure and figure out, based on the wind, where the convergence is. Where is it slamming that air together? And, you know, the specifics of where a tornado is dropping, how much is going to fall. That's where you really get into, okay, some of these higher-up models can help. But the very foundation, the basics of these things are are lost. It's, It's... encourage that you not think about these things or you not talk about them uh, when you're in these meteorology classes. And it's... uh, Yeah, you reminded me of uh, something that I teach in my classes. I teach uh, ESL down here in Mexico uh, just uh, about three days a week. And I always say this to people down here because their system of education is built on basically what you're talking about in your university. And I don't know about high schools anymore. I used to teach in the United States as well. Uh, it's They always want to teach you education is what to think. When it's actually education is not about what to think, but it's how to think. Correct. So with that we're going to take our last break, so please stay with us. Uh, ben Davison from Suspicious Observers. Uh, we're going to get into a lot more, a lot faster here in our last half an hour. And uh, if you're liking the show so far and you have some suggestions, because Ben, I believe, has agreed to come back and do another show with us, uh, send your suggestions to suggestions at kwave6.tk. That's our email suggestions at kwave6.tk and we'll be right back stay tuned hello and welcome back to kwave6 radio this is kirk spencer your host with ben davidson of suspicious observers 
Ben was we and I were talking just a little bit on our last break there. We're talking about pressure and whatnot, and he suggested that we talk about something that there's always been a lot of speculation about, especially in the United States and partly in Europe from what I've gathered from friends that I have over there, about the harp system. So Ben, Absolutely. take it from there. Well, um, whenever I uh, start talking about what's changing the weather and things like that, the logical next question from a lot of the people, at least the people who have been exposed to these topics, is, okay, well, what about weather modification and geoengineering? Well, the first thing that comes to my head is that you know, having surveyed just about everybody's arguments on these on this topic online, I can say that definitively the scariest things that are said, like um, oh they're going to they're trying to kill us all, they're they can do this, they can do that, is not supported by any statement or study or fact whatsoever. However, what's very, very real is their ability to subtly affect the weather. Um, you know, uh, some tornadoes unleash as much energy as, you know, hundreds of Hiroshima bombs. Mm -hmm. They just can't put that into, like, they can't create a tornado or a hurricane or a low-pressure system. They just can't do it. But what they can do is make it rain if there's the rain to be had in the system. They can delay the rain if they need to, if they need to push a storm one way or another, they can do that a little bit. They can uh, play with the conductivity of the atmosphere. Uh, many people believe that they're spraying aerosols in the air to mm -hmm. aid them in doing this. Just some general thoughts. It would be a very interesting trick for the Earth to be avoiding that solar system shift, doing better than pretty much all the planets, and be avoiding humans trying to mess it up as well. I wouldn't doubt at all that there could be some nefarious uses, and indeed, in practice, of some of these things. However, we also had one of the worst water shortages in the world in the central United States, until in 2011, 200 year floods hit in a 20 day span. Mm -hmm. Something unthinkable. I made a fool of myself in 2011 when I said that, look, either Tulsa or Oklahoma City is going down. This system is going to drop a mega tornado and one of these cities is going to get hit. Well, not two minutes after I released that video did I see radar rings flashing. Just things I couldn't explain. And I saw the storm pull north and miss the two major metro areas just in time to drop one of the worst tornadoes we've ever seen. Now, of course, at that time, nobody had heard of Joplin, Missouri. It happened to be in the way. <laughs> now, there were people all over the Internet saying, Oh, they attacked Joplin. They, they created a tornado and they made it hit Joplin. Mm -hmm. I sat there and I watched that thing go directly the other way. Uh, I mean, after, after the only modification I, I saw. I saw them, if anything, save thousands of people. Uh -huh. But then again, you know, try, try operating on the Internet with, uh, with that mindset. It, uh, it just basically gets you yelled at and trolls and things like that. On the specifics of, of HARP, because this is an important thing, there is a spy technique. It is called a limited hangout. Uh, in politics, they call it wag the dog or mm -hmm. whatever. Basically, they give you just enough information for you to hang yourself. They yep. don't give the worst. They give tiny little bits of it. HARP was an operation for over a decade, and nobody knew about it. Then, all of a sudden, there are books, TV shows on the History Channel, actor slash politician Jesse Ventura telling us here's your enemy on a silver platter now go scream about it on the internet meanwhile if you know anything about how the military works if that was what we were getting they had already moved on at least once oh yeah and so we have 
literally at this point millions of people on the internet putting focus towards harp and all it is doing is allowing the current modifiers to slip under the radar pun intended that time mm -hmm. it allows the current modifiers to remain in obscurity and this is this is probably one of the contra most controversial things I've ever said because the people talking about harp are the people who love this planet. They want to stop geoengineering. They want to stop weather modification. But somehow, the modus operandi of how secrets are given out just totally eludes these people. And they took the bait, and literally everyone talking about harp online is falling into the plan and helping the current modifiers get away with it. It is the single greatest uh, hurdle that the geoengineering opposition has and people are starting to see it. I've been expressing it on the channel and I, I can say, um, you know, I, I've seen evidence of, you know, anywhere from, you know, 10 to 15 percent of the um, you know, now 184,000 subscribers uh, actually, you know, commenting or getting involved or at least thinking about the things in this way. And I don't have the answers as to who is doing it now or what technology they're using. All I know is that I'm darn sure it's not Harp. Because, you know, they, they even... And when, when they did this and when they made it all public, DARPA was funding private contractors there's there's a guy on youtube who has actually who actually went in and found that it's not a government secret anymore that darpa is funding contractors there who they don't do secret work they they publish their work in in journals and things like that it's now it's now a terrific scientific operation or at least it was until they uh until the last contractor left and they shut down uh, the website but i mean it's true they're there is a lot of evidence that they're screwing with the weather on on some respect. And even if it is all benign and they're trying to stop this solar system shift from taking hold here on Earth, even if that's the case, they don't need to be doing that. We survived this 400 years ago and 400 years before that and time and time again. Playing God with our atmosphere is um, and our planet in general is really not something... I can see as a good idea in any circumstance, but mm -hmm. at the same time, can given what I've just said about the limited hangout and about HARP and about the issues of, well, Earth's not really doing so bad when you look around the solar system. True it's, enough. It's um, I, I hope I'm painting a picture of just how in trouble this opposition is. Um, they have a thousand excuses and a thousand distractions that we've all fallen for. All of us have. Uh, I mean, I, I've got, if you look back to my earliest videos on YouTube, I've got dozens of them talking about harp. Oh, yeah. I'm different. I fell into it as well. Well, there's, that, uh, there's a saying that's been going around on Facebook. Um, it was out there for a while. It hasn't been out there for a while, but I managed to save the picture and I didn't pull it up. But... The picture pretty much goes this way. It's the um, this actor who is a Marine Corps sergeant, and he's got his uniform on, and he's yelling as he usually does in most of his movies. He's got that strong voice. Uh, he's looking down at a camera, and he's talking about that Malaysian flight that disappeared in the Pacific someplace. And he's saying, they've got submarines that can find a barnacle on a uh, turtle's ass. they get uh, AWAC men... Uh, is it airplanes that can find the submarine and you're going to tell me that they can't find one commercial airline in the ocean yeah that's it, <laughs> so it, you it, have been distracted people wake up yeah, <laughs> yeah that's the whole idea they huh? find they I, I think they're the ones that hit it did you read that story about how there were some people uh on that flight who had skills in, in electronic warfare oh yeah if you were going to pull a major job and you absolutely positively had to get away with it and you could not let these people be found out, mm -hmm. you have to use a ghost, literally. Yeah. You have to use a dead person. Mm -hmm. well, what, if, what if that flight is just somewhere in Africa or somewhere on one of the 
islands over there, one of the thousand islands that's on the Indonesian line there. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, there's supposed to be a military very... base out there someplace anyway. Well, uh, the the stationary ones are the mobile ones that float around. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah, the, that's an appropriate response to that question. Yeah. So it's between that and something that Frank Herbert, the author of Dune, put it out. He says, beliefs can be manipulated. Knowledge is dangerous. And that's what I'm going to use in what you were just talking about with harp and all the rest of that. People have been manipulated. That's why I brought up both of those basically quotes. Uh, is that your beliefs can be manipulated, and people always want to believe the worst. You want to give out news, make it bad news, and I guarantee it, within 20 minutes, it will hit just about everybody you know. Mm -hmm. Good news, it'll take its time getting there, because it's not sensational. But, yes, me to bring this up, and we've only got about a little less, well somewhere around 15 minutes to go before we close the show. So we were talking about, uh, I I had given a friend of mine um, a link to USGS, and I went on to USGS just to see the earthquake activity over a seven-day period at all magnitudes. And there were around 1,600, 1,600, I think it was a little bit more, uh, earthquakes worldwide. But this is talking about the ones ranging from you can't feel it to, oh, okay, there's an earthquake going on because as you've been saying even in your videos, we haven't had much of anything more than a six-pointer recently. So it's not really anything really dangerous going on. But what I had noticed was in Alaska, Hawaii, even Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico, And the United States, these are the worst places, as far as a nation is concerned, for any kind of Earth activity. It's almost like it's um, liquefaction of the of the well of the land, and ranging in was it Alaska from about mid-state going east. I don't know if this has anything to do with oil pumping out of there. Oklahoma, we pretty much understand that's fracking down there. Uh, The West Coast of the United States, and when I was doing this, even New York State had an earthquake. And Canada had one on the West Coast, one on the East Coast, but they were minor. But And you were talking about Mexico. We're down here looking at the world and going, well, we got these earthquakes off in the ocean, but they're really not bothering us. What's going on with the rest of the world? <laughs> so, <laughs> now, For as long as I've been watching... If you ignore magnitude and you just look at occurrence of a shake, occurrence of an earthquake, there is nowhere that's more active than the west coast of the United States. Uh And that's really sort of counterintuitive when you realize that that's the only area of the ring of fire that hasn't seen a big one recently. You know, I'll explain this by how I explain to people what's happening at Yellowstone right now. What's happening at Yellowstone right now is there is a leviathan under the ground. And if you let it bottle up its pressure, it's going to pop. Mm -hmm. But if you release that pressure every once in a while, you know, the chances are the leviathan will sleep. Every 8 to 12 months, there is a significant seismic uptick at Yellowstone. Coincidentally... Every six to eight months, there is a fervor on the internet that Yellowstone is about to erupt. Mm -hmm. Now, this time, this round of press release, which I see as a tremendously good thing, occurred at the exact same time as the seasonal migrations. So what did we have? We have, oh my God, there's earthquakes at Yellowstone and the animals are fleeing. And it really, really kind of... um, it really kind of exacerbated the situation. Now, I won't, you know, go off onto that tangent, but the point is we better see significant seismic upticks at Yellowstone at least once a year. If you don't see that, start to pay attention even closer and pray for one to come release pressure. Well, to take the same principle and apply it to the West Coast of the United States, 
it's the only area that hasn't seen the big one on the Ring of Fire. And it sees the most quakes in general. You have to wonder if perhaps those littler quakes are what's keeping it from having that mega quake. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, you could say, well, all those little ones are creating this slow destabilization en route to an even bigger event. Well, th th there are those speculations, but those are only speculations. What I'm talking about is what we've seen thus far. I'm talking about the most seismically active by occurrence area in the world being the only area on the most active fault system in the world not to get a big one. Mm -hmm. And the other areas, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, you know, I consider Puerto Rico to be a far worse East Coast tsunami threat than the Canary Islands. Mm -hmm. Far, far worse of an East Coast tsunami threat. If you zoom in to the north coast of Puerto Rico on Google Earth or the RSOE alert map, you can actually see the historical landslides. And then you zoom back out and you see that it would just fire a tsunami directly up the coastline. Yep. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting. And, you know, in terms of if they're modifying the weather, by the way, they can slightly modify the ground. Yeah. Um, the the science is really no different. Uh, all, all you have to do is Google a video called Standing Wave Tank and realize that there are no hydraulics creating these huge waves. They're just pulsing certain frequencies through it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's very, very possible that, um, you know, they are trying to release pressure and keep that area from having a big one. Yeah. I, would, I mean, that's literally just... Uh, okay, let's throw caution to the wind and say whatever comes into our head, we hypothesize. That's something that could be hypothesized. Mm -hmm. Well, we only have a few minutes, and I'm trying to rush through some stuff because, like I said, we're not going to get through all of this. Uh, it's just too much fun listening to you explain all this stuff. Uh, one thing that you do mention in your videos, and I do want to touch on this one because it's something I was looking at even before I was introduced to your videos, uh, and you've made mention of it just a few times, just in the, probably the last month or two. Uh, you're talking about, uh, well, let's see, you started off with talking about the uh, how the weather changes and how, I don't remember the words that you were using. But uh, I'll give it in layman's terms. The great big donut that was over there, <laughs> that was over our North Pole, has now moved to the South Pole. Oh, the polar vortices. The there polar you go. Vortices. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, this people. Is, just... This is really cool. You know, people heard about the polar vortex this year because of how bad it was. But we get a polar vortex every winter. And, you know, it's the opposite. Uh, season in the south so during our winter it's summer down there well during our summer when it's winter down there the vortex switches sides mm -hmm. and actually goes down to the southern hemisphere and you know they have uh, a number of different explanations for this uh, at some time when I come back and we get more into some of these electrical connections between uh, places on the earth and the earth and sun and we get into the uh, uh, the Uyen stuff a bit more because boy does that require some time oh, yeah. uh, you know we will um, you know, we're going to find out that this has a lot to do with the solar wind um, and you know because it's based on when we're tilted in which axis is tilted into the solar wind we see the other axis getting this this very very powerful vortex and the only reason people heard about it this year is because indeed as we lack solar flares and the sun is weakening, it's allowing Earth's energetic systems to kind of take over and wobble and not become as confined to the polar regions. And this is one of the things that we're going to continue to see. Bad polar vortex, winter after winter. Um, I feel really bad for Detroit saying that, given what they just had, but there's, there's really not much else on the menu, at least... Uh, as long as the sun keeps doing what it's doing. The polar vortices are not going to be stuck where the, we're used to seeing them stuck. And um, they're going to be one thing that helps contribute to much, much worse winters uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. The good news is that um, 
those are not the kind of things that could cause uh, snowfall in June or July uh, because it is really so perfectly tied to the seasons. Um, and so it, it is just one small part of the story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yes, you're definitely. We'll get into that next time you come on time. Uh, come on as a guest of ours. Uh, but in well, in the last few minutes that we have, you were talking about, and I've known this for quite some time. That yes, there is ice building up on the surface in Antarctica and even at the North Pole to a certain degree, but there is a buildup of heat under the surface of the ice coming from the earth or whether it's from the earth itself or it's just um, uh, water currents that are moving out of place you know it could be as far as i know something that has to do with uh was it the bp oil spill over there in the in the gulf a few years ago but what do you see is responsible for this heating from underneath the ice right well i uh I'll go ahead and throw humility to the wind for this one, actually. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I was the crazy idiot who was saying that, hey, look, the part of the Antarctic that is exposed to our emissions and our air is freezing cold. It's gaining record ice. In fact, as the, the Arctic up north is indeed melting in a record way, the Antarctic is gaining ice at a far faster pace. It is actually setting uh, records almost every month. However, Antarctica is just doing that on the surface. It, there is one part of Antarctica that is heating and melting wildly uh, from beneath. And, you know, when they tried to say that, oh, the oceans ate global warming and uh, the heat went into the oceans, that's why we're not seeing it on the land. At first, they were trying to use that and say, oh, see, yes, it went into the water. That's what's heating uh, Antarctica from underneath. However, a very astute observation was made, uh, not by me, um, that there were no climate models that factored in uh, submarine volcanoes or um, thermal venting and heating from the bottom of the ocean. It, It escaped the models. It wasn't in there. And, um, you know, it was known that there were some pretty big volcanoes underneath the West Antarctic ice sheet, which is the part that's melting. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty well determined. Uh, This paper just came out a couple of days ago, actually. They have now determined that the melting is caused not by global warming, the, the alleged global warming, but by those undersea volcanoes pumping all that heat up there and the thermal venting which is very, very interesting. Um, it seems that there's a new chapter and a new page to the to the climate story every time we look. Mm-hmm. The Atlantic Rift is very well known for its volcanic activity under the mm-hmm. water. And um, I don't know where the western edge of Antarctica is, because as far as I'm concerned, Antarctica is the south, and it's just... Yeah, you go north and you just go any place that we live, and put it that way. So, with the heating of the ocean from the, at least the Atlantic Rift and other places that have uh, underwater volcanoes, how does that water vapor from these volcanoes that are heating the water, uh, that creates a vapor into the air, it doesn't have to be boiling to create a vapor, but how does that affect Earth? Um, the Earth's climate changes. You know, it's again, it would be really tough to answer that definitively um, because the best answer really is that we don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, The best answer is that um, is simply the recognition that there is something else that's just missing from the models. Uh And um, well, before we end this, and I know we wanted to talk about this a little bit. I don't know if you need a lot of time to do it, but at least you can do something. Maybe I'll just kind of get it in there somehow. Um, we were talking about Fukushima, the radiation that uh, came off of Fukushima, and we were talking about it before. When the Fukushima 
Daiichi plant got, uh, well, basically exploded. But USGS has a video out, it's a short video, showing how after Fukushima Daiichi had exploded, within 30 days, the radiation that went airborne covered the whole northern atmosphere. From March to April, that radiation covered the whole northern hemisphere of our Earth and was starting in on the bottom half, the southern hemisphere, uh, after 30 days. So now, as years later, as Ben says, it's covered the whole planet. Ben, you wanted to say something about that. Well, absolutely. This is, uh, in my opinion, Fukushima is one of the most important things to know about and to think about going forward. However, as with all important things, it is... Uh, rot with nonsense. For example, just about any nuclear plant anywhere in the world is going to have steam rising from it after it rains. You see people on the on the internet showing pictures of steam coming out of Fukushima and saying that you know the world's about to end because of it. Uh, if the fact that they've been doing that now for three years and the world hasn't ended, it wasn't clue enough. Just look at some other nuclear plants. However, the fact that current fear-mongering and uh, a lack of perspective is um, really tainting a lot of the current reporting on it. It doesn't change what has already happened. Uh, I think that literally what's what's leaking now could happen for decades, maybe centuries longer, and it wouldn't even come close to what happened in just the first few days. At this point, just accept that it is in every bite breath and sip you take what came out those first couple of days. And what came out the first couple of days was the worst of it. It's not going to kill the entire planet. Um, some of the, If it was going to do that, believe me, after three or four years, we would have seen more effects than this. We haven't begun to see a lot of the effects, I believe. I think that those will come into the future. However, um, the point of Fukushima is a historical one in one sense. Um, I like to tell people, look, there's no new disaster at Fukushima. There's new fear-mongering about things that don't hold a candle to what's already taken place there. But there's no new disaster at Fukushima. The disaster's already happened, and it's not over at Fukushima. It's on the planet Earth. It's everywhere. So that's... um, you know, that's one of the places where our community really, really suffers, um, where people, uh, you know, l- l- like you said, uh, I don't know, I, I can't remember if this was on air, if you said this off air, but how it's it's really easy for people to spread scary, bad news. Oh, yeah. I said it's that easy on air. People. Yeah, uh, it's, um, and they they do it because they can. Uh What's what's bad about this is they're doing it on the backs of what could be one of the worst disasters this planet has ever seen and something that will continue to affect not just Japan but the entire world for decades to come. Mm-hmm. And seeing what people are doing on the backs of that is very, very disheartening. These are people who, on all outward appearances, are part of the community. They are trusted they have loyal viewers, and um, yeah. it's yeah, it, it is what it is. We we just have to put a smile on our face, keep love in our hearts, and do uh, do the best we can. Wonderfully said, Ben. I would love to carry this into a third hour, but I know you have things that you have to do. You're back on the road and all that with the mobile observatory. Um, just in closing, I just want to thank everybody for being here. Ben, thank you for being part of the show. I know you're going to come back and do this again soon. Uh, People, he says he would come back, and I'm going to leave it up to him because he's the one who's traveling. So whenever you're ready to come back and talk some more, because I do have other questions we never got into, and uh, you mentioned a few of them, like the Uyen and whatnot. So do you have any final words? And, okay, give us your website, whatever, if you want to do that as a closing. Well, absolutely. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me on uh, and, and being such a, such a great, gracious host. Um, 
you know, before you would uh, definitely check out Mobile Observatory Project. That's at observatoryproject.com. Um, my website uh, that I have the memberships for, as you said, Kirk, is suspiciousobservers.org. But before you really ever get into that, and definitely before you consider dropping uh, $3 for a membership, spend some time watching the free videos I have. Um, they'll really let you know whether or not this is something you're interested in. I realize it's not in my best business interest to tell you guys this, but watch the free stuff for a while first. See if you are into it. See if you want to hear more. Um, and after that, if you want to uh, take a look at some of the more complex, uh, some of the ongoing research, some of the HD animations we have of you know our hypothetical stuff and stuff that's never been shown before, that's a whole other thing. But check out the free videos. It's just Suspicious Observers on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Something I look at every day. Part of my morning routine. <laughs> anyway, Ben, thanks you once again. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Sorry to cut it short, but it was just too good having Ben here, so we went a little bit over. But thank you, and stay tuned, because he will be back again in the future. Be well. Thank you for being a part of our listening audience. Stay informed of what's happening at K-Wave 6 Radio at www.kwave6radio.tk. That's www.kwave6radio.tk. All the best for you and yours.